necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and Freedomslips.com, its staff or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, Freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Well, it's time to stumble down the road with host Bridget Lynn Dogar and co-host Jenny Vaughn as they carry stones, dig holes, and wield their shovels along the way. On Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. <laughs> this is not a seated event. As they talk, run, stumble, carry, dig, drag, Laugh, fight, sing, and pray, dance, and kick, and scream, and oftentimes fall. Hey, is that a stone or a buffalo chip? Now, here are your hosts for the next two hours on carrying stones and digging holes. But I won't be there. The hell I won't. Hey, everybody. Oh. What's going on there? Okay. It sounds like the feedback is down. I just want to make sure that I'm connected. I had all kinds of weird problems trying to get on to um, um, get a group chat kind of thing to go in. I had to kind of go in a different direction. Um, So anyway, it was just kind of a little bit of a complicated getting it together and getting my guest on. But guess what? I did it. I hope. Let me see. I'm going to make sure that I Hello. have. Hello. Yeah. Okay, good. Then I have my guest on, so we're good to go. Okay, so this is Carrying Stones and Digging Holes by Bridget Lynn Dolgoff, your host. And Carrying Stones and Digging Holes radio show is on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And um, I come to you every Saturday from 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can go to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, and you can check out our website with all the other hosts as well. Remember to check out our funding area. Um, We have all kinds of amazing ways that you can help us because we are 100% listener supported. So please go check that out. We have tons of amazing heirloom seeds in which you can purchase for the long haul, um, prep up. Or, you know, get some seeds to create, you know, a food production this year. And also, if you go to schedule, click on schedule, and then click on schedule A, uh, studio A, and then you can scroll down on that page to the 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturday. And you'll find a bee with pollen on its legs flying towards a flower. If you click on that, it'll take you to another page, which will give you some information about me and how to contact me and about the show. So um, anyway, that's what we've got for you. So today um, I have a friend of mine on again, and this will be, I think, like his third time on. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about a lot of different stuff, probably head down the road of, you know, um, shamanism and sorcery, as well as the education system um, and a whole lot of, you know, other topics, whatever we can squeeze in in the period of two hours. All right. All right, everybody, I hope all you have your coffee and everything else that you need um, so that you can sit back and relax and um, hang out with us for two hours. So anyway, I just want to bring Ryan Hunter on. Hello. Ryan. Hey. How's it going? Good. All right. So I'm just going to let, you know, um, I think maybe we should probably talk. Do you want to just start off with talking about um, your recent experiences with the education system? And, you know, the other thing, too, is... You know, don't forget, you know, towards the end to actually, you know, add on exactly kind of also kind of where this is leading you or, you know, kind of the road signs. Right. That, well, you know, it's all part of, of the same you. story. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. I'll let um, you ramble. Ramble on. And well, I'm not going to go uh, in super deep depth about um, the whole debacle at the university because I'm actually planning to make an entire video about it. Um, and that's, that's a very, um, 
soon upcoming project. Um, so one of the big things, I, I wasn't uh, expecting to be on the show until a couple of days ago, but um, I've been building out a, a website and I had to scramble to just get a, a placeholder um, page up but um, so that I could announce it today, so that I could um, start uh, referring people to it. And um, actually, the plan for the website, and I I've bought the domain space you know, back in December, but um, the plan for the website was to start my own show, uh, which is going to be a video show rather than a, a radio show, but um, and maybe not you know, every week, but, um, episode one kind of got dropped into my lap and, and so we should kind of talk about that. Um, and it's a weird, it's a weird kind of synchronistic thing. So, um, in my life, I had been getting drawn in this direction of, well, okay. Recap for people who hadn't heard the shows I've been on previously. I was a I was a grad student TA um at the University of Nevada in Reno. And um well it keeps me living in a dorm room at a martial arts temple. And um you know obviously it's just a it's an institution. There's all sorts of uh constraints and frustrations involved in even trying to do that kind of work. Uh, the actual education part, the taking classes part was great. I have no issue with that, but, um, I could see more and more that, uh, I wasn't going to fit into this kind of system long term. And, uh, it also for the last year and a half or more had this growing bug. I mean, really going back, you know, six years or who knows how long to, uh, but to get my voice out there and to start uh, sharing some of the insights that I have on this reality with people who desperately need to wake up, right? And um, and it began to dawn on me, though, maybe a year ago, that um, it, especially looking at the examples of, of some of these uh, mainstream voices in the, you know, truth or community, that they actually support themselves doing this. And I started to realize that, oh, this could be a uh, out-of-the-box type of income, uh, a self-generating kind of income. Even if it wasn't a lot, it could help me deleverage from the system to actually start this show and start sharing my thoughts, which I desperately wanted to do anyway. And so... Um, these things were in my mind well before any of this happened. And, um, and it's not that I planned anything, um, but let's go into what happened with the school. So um, I wrapped up last semester, and um, at the very beginning of the winter break, I got a, a weird email message from a senior administrator, which basically suggested uh, firing me, right? I'm a teaching assistant. I, I, you know, taught classes or taught at least recitation classes um, every semester. And um, the the premise, the pretext for, for getting rid of me was that uh, I had missed filling a certain form. It was a paperwork issue. There was no job performance. There was this, this uh, woman who had sent the message didn't know me from Adam. And, and um, it struck me as so ludicrous I had to say something about it. Um, because, well, I mean, it goes back to, uh, there's, a, there's a few quotes that I, that I always associate with it. One is just the classic Alan Watts quote of eating the menu. So paperwork, paperwork is a fiction, right? We need to remember that it's make-believe. 
we write words down on paper to keep track of certain details. And as long as that helps us to coordinate our actions in reality, great. But when we try to hold reality hostage to the paperwork fiction, we're fundamentally acting in an insane way, right? So, um, and, you know, obviously it's not just that it's ridiculous. It's that it was causing me personal harm to threaten my job over this one silly form, right? Um, well, maybe not harm at the level of a threat, but, um, you know, because this administrator had the authority to see through that threat, um, I just didn't think it was a very, I didn't think it was right, and I didn't think it was um, appropriate at all to uh, to suggest even. And um, so I, I responded to that. I, I, I uh, told her what I thought of it. Well, I... I did and I didn't. I, I uh, responded quickly and um, I pulled her up about it. I, I wasn't, I didn't call her any names. I wasn't uh, super rude, but I was a bit confrontational because uh, this is ridiculous. It's utterly stupid to uh, take, you've got actual employees who are doing the actual work. By the way, the admins administration is not the actual work. They are coordinating the paperwork fiction behind the scenes. The people on the ground who are doing the actual work in the actual real world need to be more important than the bureaucratic paperwork imaginary world. Um, and, uh, and if you're not going to take care of the people who are working for you, um, I think you need to get chewed out. So, um, anyway, I pulled her up about this, but, um, I maybe didn't, uh, I maybe didn't express it well enough that she understood exactly the first time. I later ended up sending a, an email, uh, which apologized for the tone and, and went and spelled out my, my point in a more, um, just meticulous and, and, um, unemotional way but um basically for breaking ranks and daring to you know step to this this senior admin the assistant dean of the college uh i was on the outs and um it's not that i would necessarily have had to lose my assistantship but because i wasn't going to cow and i wasn't going to grovel um the administration was just, they were just trying to sweat me. They were just trying to um, intimidate me and get me to, you know, walk between their lines to, you know, get into that, uh, I don't know, what do you call those, uh, where they force the cattle into the, into the slaughterhouse? <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. It's called a feedlot. <laughs> right. So, um, anyway, uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of details. There's, uh, there are a couple of administrators who uh, really tried to basically intimidate me, and that doesn't work. I don't get intimidated at all. I mean, I lost my fear years ago. And um, so it's really funny because, okay, after the trigger got pulled on this, my, my assistantship got pulled, which means my entire job, which means I dropped out of my PhD program because I can't afford to pay to go to those classes. So probably should explain that. So when somebody's like, you know, working on higher degrees in education, part of them being able to go to the college is that they're provided with a teaching job or um, an editing job or a correcting job or you know kind of job so that it actually can give them a like a monthly income to support them going to college because it's it costs a huge amount to work on your PhD and so basically right. they're retaliated against Ryan 
by all of a sudden firing him from his teaching position, not really letting him know, and then ending up instantly, you know, um, making it impossible. And the ultimate decision for him would be to drop out out of the program. Okay, go ahead. Just for listeners yeah, so, that you know need to kind of know, they might not understand that. So because part it was, of that it, is, it was okay. a hard line. It was a really hard line. I mean, starving you out. You know, starving you to death, make it impossible for you even to buy groceries the next week, you know, kind of a thing. It was it was very aggressive. And no, it's, it's more than that, because I would literally have to go into debt, not even just to live. But, you know, let's imagine that I could move back with my family and, and whatever else, um, because, OK, what they pay the TAs is a pittance. Like I said, at the beginning, it keeps me living in a tiny little dorm in a martial arts temple. And I, you know, I love my dojo, but, um, I I don't have a, a a super nice living situation, but it is cheap and it's all I can afford based on what I was making over at the university. Um, and I was super lucky that I didn't have to go into debt just to live in this area on what they were paying. Um, and that's, you know, to do with the, the housing market in this area and whatever, but more than just the, uh, pay that you get, your stipend, as they call it, which is kind of stupid because you're actually working its wages. But um, but more than the pay that you get, they also reduce the tuition that you have to pay. And it's it's a little bit silly that you even, they can't just cancel it out and you, that you have to pay tuition at all while getting paid. But it makes it doable. Uh, once you no longer have the assistantship, no longer is my only source of income cut off. But now, instead of a few hundred dollars, my tuition is thousands of dollars, and I can't afford it. Um, and um, so that effectively forces me out. It forces me to scramble to go look for another job. And the thing is, we're talking about something that happened at the beginning of winter break. I didn't get the can until the end of the first week of classes of spring semester. So I got screwed around for six weeks, six weeks that I could have been looking for another job. And, and of course, course you have to pay. You had to pay your tuition as well. Oh, I had to pay my tuition. And I did get refunded on that because I dropped my classes in time and blah, blah, blah. But, um, but yeah, it was a whole screwy, um, it's a whole screwy debacle. It's a farce really. I mean, it, it totally deserves clown music and I'll probably have to include some clown music when I, when I make the video because it's, <laughs> it's, it's ludicrous. Um, what I found most shocking but, about it was how, you know, you having to deal with the outside world, your family, and all these other people that are, you know, embedded in the system, and how they wanted to really force you to toe the line, you know, and and um, to get yourself back into the program. And so there was a lot of pressure, kind of on that side, which you weren't going to cave to. And then how kind of disingenuous, I guess, um, the head guy that you went to to talk to him about like everything that was going on and I I think I was a little bit shocked about how he kind of played you and said well let's see if we can get you you know like reinstated and um let's see you know let me let me talk to everybody and see if that can happen but it it's so far so you're talking about the dean at this point yeah I mean yeah yeah that was a little bit silly I mean, so after the fact that you're not going to be getting your job back for the semester, because obviously they've hired somebody else to do your teaching program. They've had to, right? They can't just like, you know, they would have had to have somebody else in place, you know, at the moment of firing you. And otherwise those pro those, those classes wouldn't have gotten taught. And the other thing too, was that even if he reinstated you into the program, you literally wouldn't be able to go back till maybe you know next fall once everything was straightened out which means that you would have lost you know a huge semester and you would have had to like you know like you said run to cover 
to get a job to feed yourself, you know, like just totally a totally last minute situation and that how well, right. You know, how much denial they were in of what, you know, they had done to you, like how aggressive and um, intimidating and, you know, just a whole other, you know, amount of labels that you could place on it. I mean, it was really seriously like totally abusive from everybody involved, especially at the university level. Right. And disingenuous is the key word. It's the whole, I mean, disingenuous really underhand are are the key words to the whole situation. Um, and um, yeah, so, I mean, they couldn't actually make it about the email to the administrator uh, because then that makes it obviously retaliation, right? Um, and so they had to make it about my teaching and uh, which if you work, if you work as a teacher, especially in a uh, university system, it's pretty easy to make a case against somebody. Um, and I'll get into that in the video, but. Um, but also, too, let's just, the, you know, talk about like how difficult it actually is to be a teacher in a college setting. I mean, um, Ryan well, we would need tell to me talk these about stories. That. Yeah, Ryan would tell me this. We need to about talk about that, but I think I I want to push that off. I want to finish uh, yeah. talking about okay, the dean and and. Um, I mean, not to make you quit a program and quit being a teacher because those those students are psycho. Well, really, it's a very stressful job if you take your role as an educator seriously, and that's I'm going to come back to that, but. Um, so. They had to make it about my teaching, and the best argument they had went back to, you know, last summer um, with a course that I had um, where, you know, some of the kids got stressed out, and there was there was a thing. Um, one kid really tried to kind of stage a coup in my class, which didn't work out for him, and uh, I mean, there wasn't really even a thing that happened it was just okay well <laughs> let's move on but um the point is uh that in order to justify firing me what the chair of the department had to do was go back and to the course evals from that semester or uh not a semester the summer term and um which begs the question, why did I teach an entire semester after that if my teaching was so horrible and so unsuccessful, as he said, uh, that uh, I needed to be fired? And um, in fact, you can go back and look at the same course evals for my teaching from the fall semester, and they're entirely better. Um, and so kind of the argument falls down and I again I don't want to get too wrapped up in the details of this situation because um it, it'll get exposed but um so last week I went to talk or I guess this week technically it's Saturday um this past week I went to talk with the dean of the college about the whole situation I, I mean and here's the thing, I had multiple meetings with the chair, I had faculty interceding on my behalf, um, because the other thing that you need to know is that I was an asset to this program. They started a PhD program, I was one of the pilot students. And this is the same college where I got my undergrad. So I was a known quantity there, and they knew that I could help pr them prove out their program, their fledgling program, right? Um, I mean, so I went to uh, speak with the dean after all of this has gone down, and um, and that was the you know the day that we had lunch. I I, uh, I met with you right after, but um, I think it was it wasn't until we were in the middle of lunch, like an hour after that meeting, that I, I so. The chair of my department is, you know, had used this email 
to uh, kind of cast me at least in his head or in the meetings that I had with him, uh, like a, a loose cannon. He told me, Oh, you need to go to anger management and different things. Um, but, uh, I went to this meeting with the, with the Dean of the department. I mean, the Dean of not the department, the Dean of the college of science, Jeff Thompson. And, um, three different times he just kind of flew off the handle and I was sitting there calm and collected. I didn't cause it. It was very odd. And, um, and then of course at the end of the meeting, he kind of, well, he had assumed that I was there to get back into the program. And, um, so he, you know, threw this thing out there. I didn't, I pretty much called it as disingenuous at the time. I I even noticed, you know, like when I shook his hand, leaving his office, he had a much weaker grip than, uh, when I got there, which, you know, people may not pay attention to those things, but that was an obvious sign to me at the time that he hadn't, didn't have a real sincere intention of helping me out. Uh, and the other thing is it was really, what was discussed is that he wanted uh, to possibly get me back in as a grader for this semester. And I was asking, can I get back into my classes? Because here's the thing. There was a class that I was in that's only offered every other year. That's a requirement for my degree. So if I didn't get that class in this year, this semester, um, it would defer my degree for another two years, which is like a year past what it should be anyway. Um, and so it really was kind of an issue in that way. But um, so, yeah, he threw this thing out about getting reinstated as kind of a bone to kind of get me out of his office, I think. And um, because that's what he assumed I wanted. In fact, I was offering a friendly warning to say, hey, something's been going on in your house. I don't know if you are aware of it, but I'm giving you an opportunity to clean it up before I have to shine a floodlight on it. And um, anyway, but later on, at lunch with you, I began to realize why he got so excited at those few points in, in our meeting. And um, it was literally because he wanted to intimidate me and could not. And, um, right, because I wasn't cowing to his, oh, supreme authority and whatever, big office, nice view, a really nice view ridiculously big office. There's no reason for him to, um, to need that. But anyway, um, so I had the, the discussion yeah. with the Dean. Yeah. So let me just and throw a point out there. There's been no motion. There's been no motion. So, uh, I don't, you know, it's pretty clear at this point that there's no, there's not going to be any, kind of reprieve with the university system and I'm not um I'm not explicitly disappointed about that. So let's go back. Let's go back to well, Can I throw something in there real quick? Okay. Okay, so one of the things that you know we talked about and that you know we've always had a conversation about is the integrity <clears throat> because you can't really right walk the path of sorcery or shamanism or whatever you want to call it where you have personal power where eventually you hope to be able to bend the universe, right? <laughs> In whatever way that you want. But you have to have this integrity, right? Which means that every situation you're in, you have to deal with it in an integrity way. You don't have to be confrontational or hostile, but you, in order to stand in your power, you have to do everything that's visibly, visibly possible, right? And so when you were, you know, talking, with the you know head dean guy 
and he realized or you know there was the inner he may not have really realized it at the time he may not realize it but there was this exchange of power that was going on and because you were in in your integrity you said everything that you needed to say you showed up when you were asked to go to these meetings you know you responded in emails you did all the things that you needed to do which you know created you operating in full integrity basically there's no way when people are operating in a lack of integrity that they can really have anything that they can throw at you right so this is kind of something that i've been learning too a little bit deeper because i don't think that you know good stocking work right can't be applied mm -hmm. or used to overcome situations events or people unless you have this integrity because otherwise you're using power of wounding right or um you know, you're using powers of lies and deceit, um, control, manipulation, which are not sorcery, not shamanism type practices, but in fact, you know, witchcraft. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a common misconception is that people think stalking is lying and manipulating, and it's not. Um, stalking is a very subtle thing. Uh, when you really apply stalking, it's not a matter of lying. You have to be able to stand in your integrity 100%, but you can also shape your personal truth. Um, and that's, that's just a matter of how you assemble your world. I mean, it is sorcery. It is sorcery in the, in the most, um, fundamental sense. Um, but, Stalking is not the same thing as being disingenuous. It wouldn't work if it were. And um, integrity is a huge subject. So let's let's start to crack that, and maybe I'll come back to some of the other thoughts I had. Um, okay, integrity, impeccability, um, stepping into your heart. I mean, there there are different. Um, there are different terms and whatever. I think integrity is a very um, misunderstood concept. Like when we're children, uh, we get introduced to this word and, oh, well, what is that? Well, it's telling the truth all the time. Okay, is that it? No, it's got other stuff. It's kind of like general nobility and gallantry and, you know, it's a very nebulous concept in our society, really. Um, but integrity, true integrity is simple. The only thing that is, uh, confounding to people about it is that they are not in their hearts to begin with. So they don't understand integrity simply means being true to yourself in every situation, being true, not to your ego, but to your core nature. And um, and an integral part of that. Integral. Oh, that's another one. So another another uh, term for integrity. And these are all related concepts. So integrity at one end of the spectrum could mean impeccability. At the deeper end of the spectrum means living as the completeness of yourself or the totality of yourself. Sorry, that's, I'm trying to use the, uh, the, the terms that, that you'll find in Castaneda since we're talking Nahualism, but uh, living is the totality of yourself because integrity, what does it fundamentally mean? Etymologically, it's being integral, being whole. And um, it means having pulled all your pieces back together to live as the complete being that you should be. Uh, but that also means coming into your heart and getting in touch with what your actual core nature is and buying out of all of the disingenuity and uh, illusion that is uh, 
put upon you by this world, by our competitive uh, impulse, right? It's uh, it's an impulse that kind of fed to us to be, you know, at odds with each other all the time and drive our egos up to the point where, you know, we have to um, prove ourselves to each other all the time, which is where people get into this you know, hierarchy and authority and need to intimidate other people into cowing to them. But that's sheer ego. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but it's a living from the out it's a living from the outside in instead of living from the inside out. For sure. And so the people who are who are locked in this system and of course the higher up you go in this system, and I'm not just talking about this university system uh, institutionality in general, but the, the entire system, government, the financial system, um, education is no exception. Media is no exception. Um, anywhere that you plug into the mainstream system, the way that you get advancement is by complicity with corruption and psychopathic behavior, really. And, um, so the, the further up you go in the system, the more you, you find this and the less people have any clue of what you're talking about when you try to talk to them about integrity. Um, but here's the thing. I reached the point in my personal development where it makes no energetic sense anymore for me to ever step outside of my integrity. This job, even the degree that came along with it, were not even close to worth stepping outside of my integrity. And uh, part of that is another concept, which is uh, having no stake in the outcome. And this is an important concept. I remember, so Max Egan just brought it back up last night on his radio show, which uh, was interesting because you and I were talking about it at lunch last week. And, um, it's been definitely on my mind a lot, but maybe a year ago, um, I remember listening to his show and he brought that concept up and it sounded so challenging to me. How can I have no stake in the outcome of my life? That's crazy, right? I mean, we're taught that we need to have a stake in the outcome. We need to want whatever, but, um, and we're, we're constantly striving against everyone else to get ours. But I guess what happened, um, I mean, this, this particular incident was what showed me that I had lost all stake in the outcome of my life. Um, and it's not that it was, you know, the end of my life to leave this PhD program. Um, but what it was is that, um, well, I'm not getting anywhere anyway. I'm have no foothold in the system. This, this tiny little, you know, TA job. Oh, and, uh, I made the point to the Dean during our meeting. I was like, okay, you know, but th this whole thing really just doesn't make good press. Right. And, uh, I don't mean that as a threat. It's just, you know, if you do something shitty, <laughs> I'm going to say something about it obviously. And, um, and, uh, and I was referring to the chair at that point in time. I wasn't saying you as in him accusatory, but, um, he laughed. He's like, I'm not afraid of you. You're just a grad student. You know, like you're, you're a little peon. I'm so goddamn important. Um, kind of thing. And, um, well, which is funny. I don't know if you can hear the thumping in the background. I'm, I'm at the dojo right now. There's a class going on downstairs. But um, when you study martial arts, you get a little different perspective on it. I can sit back there. Oh, you're not afraid of me, really. Because, you know, I, I could break your neck right now. Right now. <laughs> you know, um, not that I would do that or anything, but come back to the fundamental level of reality. 
in terms of the being that you are and the being that I am, uh, you're kind of not shit, dude. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so there's a story. Oh, so um, back in the 90s, um, you know, I was a huge follower of Carolyn Meese. And mm -hmm. Carolyn Meese had been a journalist and she um, all of a sudden started seeing people's energy bodies and different things and starting to see their different diseases and connecting the dots of these diseases. And most diseases that you get energetically that are going to make you sick and cut the longevity of your biological suit, right, because they leak your energy, which is the battery that runs the biological suit. So... You know, I do a lot of medical intuitive type work. And so she came out in the 90s with um, energy anatomy. If people haven't heard that, they should really get by the six CD set um, or download it or whatever else and really listen to it several times. Um, but then after that, she came out with this work that she called it, called it, <laughs> she called, um, <laughs> um, she called woundology. And basically, it? that's it's it's called woundology, and I'm sure we've oh, had this woundology. Okay. Yeah, we've probably had this conversation before because a lot of the work that I try to do with other people is about stories. I story tell about you know that's how I get people to kind of understand what's going on. So anyway, so during the period, uh, she said of how people interact in this reality, um, and that this is where the power issues, you know, integrity issues, all these different kinds of um, things kind of come to light. And she said it, it's, it's, it's like this pathetic. So, you know, you walk into a breakfast restaurant, you sit at the, you know, one seat, you know, front bar, because uh, you're by yourself. So you're, there's a seat open there. So you sit down, you sit down next to somebody you know, I'm a female, so I'd sit down to another woman and we're eating our breakfast and talking. And basically there's this game that goes on. It's a power game and it's from the second chakra area, right? Um, okay. Um, and so uh, you're playing this power, you know, you're you're, there's a bush in front of you and you guys are both taking action stances going around the bush to figure out who has more power. But what we do is we're going to go back into the wound because we have to bond over a wound. We have to, we have to bond over a less, a lesser um, place, you know, that will bond us forever and not allow us to actually make a decision not to have that relationship. Now, if we can't walk around this bush trying to um, sort out what the individual's power is between the two in the conversation, then the situation will end and that, you know, there won't be a, a long-term relationship. So this is based on like, you know, like native teachers and stuff that I've had, we talk about, you know, all my relations, how do I relate? to other people and this world. So on a lower scale, we're trying to figure out where our power is with this other person and trying to find a place that's higher than them to eventually manipulate them from the third chakra, which is the um, battle, power third chakra. chakra battle. Yeah. Um, and never, you know, making it up to the place in the heart, right? A heart connection. Um, and so basically she talks about how, you know, we'll have this manipulative conversation that we don't realize we're having with this other person to figure out what the power is. Um, meanwhile, trying to intimidate them, but also trying to find equal ground in, in usually really negative placement. So for right. example, woundology. So you're, I'm going back and forth with this woman while we're eating breakfast, sitting next to us. And we keep telling each other stories or talking about different things just to kind of find out what the key, the keys are, if we can meet common ground in the past. Um, and then, you know, one of them will say, like, say, you know, I'm sitting next to her and she says to me, oh, I never got donuts in my whole life when I was a kid. They never gave me a donut. I mean, this is like how pathetic this stuff is and how long term mm -hmm. this stuff is that we 
um, you know, have these wounds. And so we operate out of integrity kind of a thing. So then I would, my whole thing was I'd look in my data bank in my past and try to see if there was anything in there that I could, you know, come to, you know, this thing around this bush, right? Because we have to come to some kind of wounded common ground in order to have a power struggle relationship, which is what we're taught to do, manipulation, control. So then I say, oh yeah, you know, I forgot I loved blueberry bagels and you know my parents never gave me blueberry bagels even though it was like the number one thing I loved so then I shoot back yeah when I was a kid I always just wanted blueberry bagels and my parents never gave me any and, and then we both go oh oh poor you poor you so now we're bonded by you know a sense of blood obligation compromise right uh, in not this blood loyalty. relation blood letting yeah energy yeah. yeah energy because our blood is also energy you know my teacher Bobado, my shoshone medicine man teacher Bobado used to say that our blood is crystalline and that it contains and there's proof you can look at it under a microscope you can see all the crystals in it and all the metals and all the minerals and everything floating through it so it's actually you know it's energetic so you know we're talking about energy bloodletting obviously right so now we're now we're bonded over this so unbelievably pathetic scenario in our life <laughs> um right. And now we have this continuation of a power struggle. And then the next level is to figure out who has a stronger sense of power. In our world, if you have more education, if you're beautiful or handsome, if you dress, you know, a particular way, or if you start a trend or, um, you know, um, you come from a wealthy family, you're more put together. You know, these are our outside world you know, identifiers of people that have more power, which equals authority over us. And even in friendships of lifetimes, you know, so we right, are not but it's interesting. to have, you know, integrity if we did. Yeah, go ahead. We, we wouldn't have these weird kind of power struggles that last forever that create unlimited drama and constant power struggles you're going to face. But anyway, go ahead. Well, I, I was just thinking it's interesting to see the dichotomy between social power and personal power, because you see these people who get into these positions of authority who have no personal power, whatever. They're completely given over to, well, oftentimes demonic influences, although they're not aware of it, and um, they have no structure. They have no spine to do anything which is why they get manipulated into these kind of psychopathic acts, like yanking somebody's job out from under them for not filling a form without even so much as a face-to-face. -face. That's something that I didn't uh, mention before, but it was that I email. Um, but um, I was talking with a friend of mine uh, the other day who just recently got out of the military, and one of the comments that he made was... Uh, that, uh, you know, from from being in the military, from being in the Air Force, that, uh, you know, bitching and complaining is a great bonding mechanism. Like, that's how that's how they bond as a, you know, squad or whatever is by, you know, complaining about the higher ups, the officers and whatever, because um, they're being assholes, because that's how the system works. But um it's exactly what you're talking about. They're bonding over, you know, this negative, like, victim mentality rather than, you know, connecting at the heart and, and uh, supporting each other and sharing in real power. Yeah, and real power takes integrity. Right. And, I mean, for our species, real power takes Connecting at a heart level takes community, right? I mean, this is something This is something that I've maybe only become aware of in the last uh, year and a half or two years, but the, the actual path to freedom is community. 
it's funny. We think that uh, freedom means, you know, like this rugged individualism that we're taught to believe in, in, yeah, in this country anyway, uh, to where, oh, I can stand on my own and, you know, screw ev- everybody else, whatever they, you know. Um, but actually, especially in the face of what we are faced with as a species at this particular moment in time, the only way that any of us are going to be free is if we pull together and remember our humanity, start connecting on a human level and create communities again, instead of being so divided and so fractured that we're just all at odds with each other, picking each other apart over bullshit. Yeah, the whole, I mean, the whole system is like, you know, one giant power struggle, but it's from a place where there is no power. And really, you're delusional. Your development has become, you know, like delusional. Uh, You're, you know, everything that's taught you in your life has made you 100% delusional. You know, hallucinations, delusion, uh, daydreaming, you know, with like no real power to actually implement or apply. Right. Your and, stake um, in your, your stake in your own hmm, life. Exactly. I love that. Right. You think you have this stake and then, you know, your mind gets bent around all of these just knotted constructs in order to try to apply that stake and stick it to the other guy. But uh, none of that's real. That's not reality at all. That's just a construct. And even the idea that you're in competition with the next guy is just a construct. (laughs) I mean, I'm going back to Max Egan again, but he makes the point great, is that uh, we are naturally cooperative creatures. Humans in their natural state are heart-centered and community-oriented. They're not this massively competitive cutthroat species. We would never have survived. We would never have survived that way. Look at how we organize ourselves naturally in you know, tribal situations. It's very cooperative. And um, not that there aren't you know, minor conflicts and whatever. And okay, there's, there's a certain amount of competition that's natural to us just because, you know, we are sexual animals. There's sexual competition, but as a community, we don't need to be fractured and at odds with each other over everything, every aspect of our lives. Actually, most of that is complete nonsense. Yeah, so I just kind of tell kind of more of a story that happened this last summer. Maybe so people can maybe grasp this, you know, at a little deeper level. And like my teacher Bobito would say, I don't want you to have any emotional attachment to what I'm going to say. I want you to pay attention to where kind of the power scenario is instead. Um, so please, I don't want any people um having any kind of other emotions other than balance about this story okay so last summer i ended up moving to the desert and there was an old garden bed with a fence around it and anybody that knows me i'm a soil nut and i like to grow food and i like to be in the soil and i like to grow plants and i like to build relationships with plants and a friend of mine sent me some native seeds um, that I could start building a relationship with. And that's a whole other thing. Um, it was a whole other, you know, let's just say uh, doorway of multidimensional experience with the native plants that were sent to me. But anyway, um, so I decided, you know, talk to the landowner, or whatever else, and said, you know, hey, I'm going to develop that garden bed you know, fix it up. And the problem is it was slanted. It really needed to be built up on this other side. Um, And just like a whole other, you know, just everything that had to do with that little teeny, we're talking maybe 12 feet wide and maybe like 32 feet long. Okay. It's teeny. And I remember you made some videos about it. Yeah. And so it was like a battle zone 
once I started to develop it and I realized like that this landowner felt naturally more powerful than I did because I came here to live on his land, right? Because, you know, I'm having financial trouble. Not that I owe anybody debt. I'm integrity. I don't, I don't live above my means. Oh, hey, commercial, be back in four minutes. good-looking people out there in Revolution Radio. This is Mario. I invite you to join me Thursdays at 6 o'clock for this, that, and the other. The show about you, the show about me, but ultimately it's a show where we try to have a little bit of fun. We discuss important topics and we do our best to be apolitical. So I invite you, put on your favorite pair of comfy sweats, your smoking jacket, and grab a beverage of your choice and join me Thursday evenings at 6 o'clock for this that in the other on Revolution Radio. Enter into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio Freedom Slips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. <laughs> From the astral realms to the physical plane, the halls of power to the walls of home, the multiverse to the innerverse, all will be haunted by the ghost in the machine. I am Steve Zeraloff, the ghost in the machine, Mondays, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Studio B, exclusively here on revolution.radio Do you or someone you know suffer from poor circulation, shortness of breath, or chest pains? Are you looking for a more natural solution to help overcome these problems? People tell us that after just a few months taking Extendivite, their doctors have noticed unexplainable improvements in their overall health. For more information, visit heartdrop.com or call 1 877 928 8822. Extend your life with Extendivite. And tell them Nighthawk sent you, because if you call this number and tell them Nighthawk sent you, you'll get $5 off your first order at ExtendedBite.com. Thank you. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host...
Hey everybody, it's Bridget. Hey, we're heading into the second hour and I just wanted to, you know, finish kind of the story that I was talking about um, before we left, which is this land um, that I um, came to live on. Um, mind you, I always leave things better than when I came. One of the things that I ex really massively accelerate in is soil restoration and growing food. Uh, it's something that I've studied. I actually have an education in it. I actually went to Steiner College and went through the biodynamic certification program and have interned on farms. So um, I'm not just doing a garden, you know, like I'm actually when I'm going to restore some soil or whatever else, I'm going to do it in the highest, you know, integral way for the land, for the neighborhood, you know what I mean? For the environment, for the animals, you know, like I do it at above scale. And so it's one of the things that I can, you know, offer. So me and the landowner, you know, he just at every turn would create conflict, you know, would control where I could get the sand. Okay, the whole property is sand, you know, to develop the bed to be flat. I had to, I had to wheelbarrow a lot of sand in. It was really difficult to get something that I could drag sand from one place to another to the garden bed um, because you know, wasn't really given a whole lot of tools or the tools were broke and not operating kind of a thing. Um, and so, you know, did this, you know, at every inch against all odds. It actually took me three months to prepare a garden bed because of the fighting and that every time I would go out there to work on it, um, that, you know, he would come out and create some major kind of drama start screaming, throwing a temper tantrum, fighting, um, kind of, you know, kind of pretty abusive. And I would just set everything down and I, I just would like walk away for a while. I mean, at one point it was a three week standoff over me bringing, going down the road with the wheelbarrow to another property, <laughs> filling it up with amazing horse duty that had no chemicals no I found like the best horse duty I could um, and to bring back and it took me about a week working you know a good six hours a day to be able to do this to get enough horse pucky in there so that you know I could help to remedy the soil so I offered all the labor um, the I resourced all the products. I mean, otherwise it would have costed, you know, probably about $300 in good compost to be delivered to be able to do the same things that I was doing. And so it was a constant battle and fight. And I started to kind of see this programming of control, you know, um, that, you know, he thinks that he knows everything about the garden and how to grow things. I mean, it was like, it was like a constant battle every little step of the way it was like a, a major fight and I just started to see that he really had no power over the whole situation and then there was also this other part of him that wanted to control my time because you know I had come here needing you know needing a place um, not having you know a lot of resources uh, I don't need a whole lot I'm pretty self-sufficient and I give way more than you know, I get. Um, and so what I've learned from people is that, you know, he thought I was coming here because, you know, I was wounded, right? And so he was acting like he thought in a compassionate way to help me. But then the problem is, is that he started to realize, like, I'm not wounded at all. <laughs> I'm um, pretty self-sufficient, can take care of myself, don't really need a whole lot of people. And um, that I could, you know, pay the power bill for the, um, you know, pretty much the whole power bill for the property and gave quite a few things. And I don't use, you know, things here. I try to use whatever that I can um, generate. But this, it was so sad to see how like this huge power struggle happened over garden and soil and insects and birds um, and the power struggle for him to dominate every situation, even though he had no background in gardening, he had no education in gardening, um, and that it was interesting based also that he was a man, that his whole mindset, I think, from the get-go of me coming here, even though he said there were no strings attached, you know, he wanted to help me, and even though I've given him everything, in, even though, right, because I don't live for free, <laughs> Um, I don't take advantage of other people. It's not part of my integral, you know, way that I live, my integrity. 
Um, and so he kind of had a mindset of how could he take me away from the garden to control my time and energy, because this is what it started to become, um, to, you know, do what he wanted to do. So then he started fighting with me over cleaning his house. <laughs> you know that this is where I should be you know like I should be some kind of slave cleaning his house this whole male female paradigm um kind of starting to emerge too in this power struggle um so when you're operating in a place of integrity like you know there's periods where I, I blow up at him um but most of the time I can you know pretty much I just walk away because there's no there's nothing for me to defend because I'm living in a right. place of integrity. So I'm not coming in at a weaker point and I don't have to defend myself and I don't have to, you know, play this, you know, beat around the bush game trying to find a common wound because I don't have those wounds and I don't want to, I don't want to build any kind of foundations from a premise of wound or lack of power. Now I'm not saying, you know, it's a good thing to overpower people, but that would fall into the ego part. And the third chakra is where we have this battle. We never are in the center of the chakra. That's why everybody's collapsed in the midsection of their, you know, torsos and their structures and they have breathing problems and digestive problems. A lot of it has to do with the, the, the struggle internally. And it goes from total insecurity and powerlessness to, you know, overpower trip and ego. And the balance in order to make it up the bridge into the heart is to just stand in the middle in the balance of it and not sway from one extreme to the other. So it just shows like where a lot of us are suck, stuck and where we're losing a lot of power and a lot of shamanism work, you know, even like Carlo Castaneda, Don Juan, even like other people that I've studied with, you know, your place of power, where your power really is, the power of your body, the power of your health, the power of your mind, the power of your, how you deal with your environment, your place in the environment comes from that third chakra and that chakra needing to be in balance, which is in, in integrity instead of, you know, powerlessness and insecurity um, or over, you know, you win a big win. Um, then, you know, your ego is inflated and you have an overpower on the other side. So the, the center of that third chakra, in order for it to bring it together and pull it into balance, especially if you have health problems there, is, you know, getting yourself in, into integrity. That way you can I travel like what you the said. passage to the heart. I like what you said there about having nothing to defend. Because uh, when you have no stake in the outcome, you have nothing to defend at all. And... Um, Again, this is an interesting concept. Um, it's kind of funny how it came about. I, I had, this is a thread I had to pick up from earlier in the conversation, but um, the whole debacle with the university was what showed me that I had actually lost stake in the outcome. And it's not that I ever had a stake in the outcome either. It was imaginary. But um, the real reason the real reason I found that I don't need to have a stake in the outcome is because it doesn't help. It's because I can want all the things that I, you know, can conceive to want. And uh, then I'm just frustrated in my life because I don't get those things. <laughs> and um, it does absolutely no good. And the thing, I think the thing that people don't understand when I, I mean, I've explained this to, you know, friends and family at this point. I haven't, uh, I haven't yet made my show uh, about the whole situation, but um, the thing that people don't seem to realize is it's like, oh, well, you had all of these opportunities to just like not say that or, you know, back off of, you know, different things. You could have just cowed to the authority and, and had your job still, basically. And um, that's not, well, first of all, that, that would be stepping out of my integrity. And that's not, um, again, it doesn't make any energetic sense for me. But the uh, 
the larger thing is I didn't have to call this woman out about what she did. I could have just filled the form and gone on with my life. But, and, you know, just made nice and, okay, I did it. Don't fire me, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, I wasn't really thinking about me. I mean, I was I was thinking, you know, abstractly about the, the situation and how absurd it was, but also thinking about, well, what if this happens to anybody? That's not okay. It doesn't have to be me. I caught this in time to, like, just do the thing and not have to suffer consequences, but I can't say nothing because if this happens to one person, that's utterly unacceptable. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a broader thinking. It's a more global uh, way of approaching situations that people aren't very familiar with. They're really only familiar with the self-interest approach to situations mainly. Um, yeah, there's a term, the thing it's, is, called, it's called social responsibility. Right. And um, the thing that people really, I think, can't conceive when I, when I tell this story, a lot of people, sleepers, you know, but um, I don't live for myself. Like, in order to make any possible sense of trying to live for me, of course, I'd have to have a stake in the outcome. But realistically, I'd have, to, I'd have to be getting something out of it. I'd have to be getting something back out of this existence, which, well, not only am I not, but if you kind of delve into that a little deeper, it's um, kind of ludicrous. There's no, what is there to be had out of this? Only what it is. That's it. So just do it. You don't have to try to get something back out of it. You just commit to the experience and have it. And don't leave your integrity. <laughs> don't step outside of your heart. Um, because that's a losing proposition. Um, yeah. So there's a there's another kind of a, like a theory thought, you know, kind of story that I talk a lot about about this kind of stuff is the balance. You know, your heart is where the balance is. Um, just like, okay, say for example, a plate, you got, you're holding a plate and you, you kind of know this cause you, you know, have to listen to me. <laughs> 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 um, you don't have to listen to me. Right. But, um, anyway, so, but I do. Yeah. So in some of the, um, native belief systems, there is this idea about this medicine wheel, which is a, right. which, which is a multidimensional construct, by the way. And it's also um, one of the things like Don Juan used to always say to Carlo Castaneda, there's a lot of discussion about being in your power spot. And sometimes you have to, you know, figure that out where it's going to be physically, you know, like a certain place in the house. Um, and these, right. you know, power places literally are said to protect you from anything happening to you. So say, for example, you know where your power spot is in your yard or your house or out in the forest or wherever you're at. And there's trouble, there's a power struggle coming, right? Trouble. And you go to that place, it almost can actually like shield you from, you know, and, and also increase your generation of power uh, to, you know, um, you know, handle whatever is necessary in, in the power struggle that's coming, you know, in a good way, in a safe way. So in our um, medicine wheel is, you know, people can go online and look that up, but, you know, as a circle and then it has, you know, the four directions on it. And then it has gateways and doorways that actually go into it from different directions. And then it has gateways and doorways that, that, um, enter you, the creator, uh, our ancestors, star beings, you know, the above, and then, you know, the lower part, like the earth where your feet are kind of grounded. And so, one of the things that I've really been working with, especially since the last few years, like I've really, the, my key word for every year so far has been adaptations to um, ceremony. So I'm working through all of this um, stuff to learn to live how every moment, being in the moment, 
um, and being able to live, you know, basically a life of um, ceremony. So one of the thoughts is that our life, our personal medicine wheel um, is like it's hanging you know, um, some say that that's held by the spider medicine, which is, um, you know, the silk strands, four silk strands holding us into the inf infinite, into the energy field, to the multi, you know, dimensional um, spaces. And that we are in the center, just like the spider in the center of this wheel, this medicine wheel that we've created, right? But we have to be careful to stay in the center, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's where where we're at. That's the center of our life. And then the medicine will yeah, out. Yeah, you get out us. on the spokes and you get dizzy. <laughs> right. Or, you know, you're not secure in your foundations. You know, part of it can unattach at any time. And so this is what happens. Well, you're totally powers. disoriented. You're spinning on the outside of the wheel. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So what happens is, is that every time that you step out, you're pulled out of your center, right? You allow that being pulled out of your center, you know, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, um, you know, with power struggles outside of yourself, then it pulls you further and further to the edges of that wheel. And um, one time I was really working with it. And if I was working with just the flat medicine wheel with me in the center of it, and it's, you know, holding, you know, in the universe, any mo movement that I make down that wheel to like go to a certain direction, say, for example, we'll just use kind of one thought, say there was something coming up the south gate, the south side of my medicine wheel, you know, and in a lot of different indigenous people have different belief systems about the medicine wheel and the different gateways and doorways and, you know, where to walk into it. Um, and so I'm just going to use like South gate as physical world. And so I'm having a lot of physical world experiences and these people are trying to hook me into using my power. And then I start coming at them towards the South gate without thinking and realizing where I'm at. And then just stepping back into being in the center of that wheel. Right. So there's also this protection force that goes around you. Right. Um, but if you, react and you step out of that medicine well several things start to happen that um you all your experiences your money your energy and everything else once that medicine wheel starts to tilt radically all that stuff starts to slide off like it's loose objects and it starts to fall off into the abyss so every time you get pulled you know off the center or in your integrity your balance or in your heart you're actually losing huge amounts of energy, huge amounts of power, experiences, um, and all kinds of things. That's why when you decide, when you react to something, things start to get a lot worse because now you have a lot less power and a lot less resources in your own medicine wheel because you dumped it. Your cheese slid off right. your cracker and you can't get it back. And so, um, and then the other thing, too, is like, like I said, it operates kind of as a protection shield around you as long as you stay in the center of it. Because you're going to know, standing in the center, every move that the person, the enemy, the event, whatever you want to call it, or, you know, energy of another person or a person, um, you're going to feel where they're going to be coming on to those threads, you know, depending on where they're approaching you from which direction within your balance and your place and your wheel. So... You know, I, I sometimes I work with people and some people get get it as, you know, mental. They're like, oh, yeah, that's that's a good way to talk about it. Some people get it in a feeling thing. Some people need a visual, you know, of where their integrity is and where their balance is and where their power spot is. And so you could actually be protected by being in your center, being in your integrity, being in, you know, the center of your will from a major car accident, you survive it relatively having no problems because your energy field had a lot of room and energy and power in it that it took some of the brunt. So sometimes right. even the outside stuff that comes at you, and then you can also, if you're in integrity and you're in your balance, you know right away what the other person is doing, you know, as they're starting to move up on your web. Right. I mean, getting into your heart is the way to expand your field out. 
and you don't um like you grow by standing in your heart you don't and that's the same that's the same thing as that sense of community where you're connecting with people on a heart level you have your being has expanded to the size of that community um i mean that's kind of you know an emotional way of looking at it but emotion is one aspect of energy and it's an energetic truth and um so yeah getting to the center of your medicine wheel the you know standing in the center of your world what they're right meaning buddhists talk about the same thing they just have slightly different words for it but um this idea I, I I have a, I have my own kind of word for it because I discovered it. I mean, I kind of I kind of came to spirituality. I shouldn't say came to spirituality, but I developed in a in an odd way because I didn't have uh, really much teaching or um, I, I shouldn't say teaching, but I didn't have like a human teacher for a long time, and I didn't have uh, you know, an explicit tradition and lineage. Um, what I had were, you know, inorganic beings coming to me and just showing me random things. And, um, but one thing that I, the, the, the state that I found, uh, which I call aphoria. Now, everybody knows what euphoria is. Um, if you're at all, uh, you know, if you're, into psychology or if you maybe even just have knowledge of, you know, psychoactives and discussions of, you know, drug effects, you might know what dysphoria is. It's the opposite, right? So euphoria is just kind of an overwhelming good feeling. Dysphoria would be an overwhelming bad feeling. And aphoria is the one in between. It is an overwhelming neutral feeling. (laughs) <laughs> it is a bright, white, intensely neutral state of being. And it's um, it's a little bit odd because in this state, in, in the true state of aphoria, as I call it, there is no desire. There is no, again, no stake in the outcome. It's a state where I'm unable to care whether I not whether or not I continue to exist for another instant, it's that detached, and it's also the precursor state for seeing. Um, for those who, you know, are into Nahualism and 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 uh, understand that in a way, but um, it's not happy. It's not sad. It's not interested. It is just observing. And um, it's kind of odd. It's like we're, we're conditioned not to want that state. We chase after happiness. We chase the dragon all the time. But if you just allow yourself to detach and back off to that neutral thing where you just allow the world to evince itself to you and don't really make any judgment or, you know, try to contrive things with your mind, then you discover an immense amount of power from that state. And um, so all of the things that we're conditioned to do, our consumerist culture, stoking our appetites and trying to get us to, you know, chase after these things that will make us happy are all getting us to run away from our power. Yeah. Well, and the other thing, too, that comes to mind is, like, words like the thing, you know, um, um, the going to the place of the no thing N O T H I N G or nothing going to the nothing or going to the no thing, which is even can be um, delivered as um, K N O W thing, no thing. Um, 
And then versus the everything, you know, everything that's outside of us. Um, right. And the, so if you go, and then the no thing, the, the first time we met, you started talking about going to the no thing. And uh, that was, that was the first thing that I latched onto about you was that you had this knowledge because I had had that experience. And I tend to call it the untempered void. But when you leave the everything and you go out to where there is nothing, no thing, there is still the spirit. In fact, only by going out to the untempered void do we get undistracted enough to even identify what the spirit is. And then when we come back into the everything, our connection back to spirit comes through the heart chakra. And people, I don't think, understand the heart chakra well enough because they think of the heart as being emotions. But most of what we call emotions comes from the navel chakra. It's watery, emotional garbage. I mean, you know, it, it serves its function, but it's all out, of, all out of balance, all out of proportion with the way we live our lives. Um, but I'm not talking about that navel chakra emotion stuff. Heart chakra is love. Heart chakra is community. Heart chakra is connection with your world. Connection with your world from a place of integrity within yourself. Right. Because if you trust yourself and, you know, it it would be the difference between like a lot of communities is what I see on, you know, just on a physical level. A lot of people will come there because or try to find communities to go on to because they have no skills. They are unmotivated. They're coming from, you know, more of a powerless place to deal with this reality right. and want to escape. And so then when they get in these communities, they've usually lied about what they can do or their potential. Um, and then because they do that, then they end up, um, you know, fighting with the other people in the community because the other people are unwilling to take care of them because they came there as a that. wounded a wounded way versus a place of, you know, power kind of a thing. Um, and, and actually making the community better. Um, so the heart chakra is where, you know, we have, we stand in our, our full power in the center of our, our universe. And then how we choose to have social responsibility to, um, seek out community to, um, help others, you know, make things better, teach people, um, you know, uh, just even adding labor or whatever else that's necessary. But yeah, the heart is, and you know what, the heart is the key between um, the, uh, you know, third chakra battle and the throat chakra. So third chakra is my will, which is all screwed up in that whole area, which we already talked about. And then throat chakra is divine will. So I can't even speak the magic. I can't even, you know, make any kind of power, uh, whatever the proclamations or any of this kind of stuff that's in the system that people believe. I can't do any of that until I make the passage of the heart and I get right with myself and I get right with my world and start living in a good way, right? That's what the native people would say would be living in a good way, being a good human and being in a good way and walking, you know, like a good way. So thing is like you, um, you have to walk the passage, you know, the passage between um, this battle that you have with everything and including yourself. And then you have to start finding the no thing, (laughs) which is the heart and then standing in the power of that And then that will connect and open up the door to the higher energy bodies that go, you know, above into the multidimensional ranges. And so then you can actually start to connect with your throat and your throat chakra as more of a divine will and being able to. And that's when they really know. So, you know, when Ryan started talking (laughs) university in different language, then they're accustomed. They knew he was awake. (laughs) We have to get rid of him at all costs. We can't have any of this kind of, you know, um, energy going on here. You might wake up some other people. (laughs) Then we won't have our everything third chakra battle for control. 
But then you can then once you make the passage of the heart, which is you settle down and you go into the no thing, you find actually more bliss than you've ever had. And um, and and altered states of um, peace. Sometimes, you know, great, great amounts of peace and it's a place that you can go to. But then you got to get to that third chakra. Then it'll take you to the third chakra where, you know, you start to manifest your world and you start to create a new vocabulary um, as you're constructing that new world, you know, from a place of the no thing with your place of balance. And so you, you start to really, that's where you really start to kind of get a foothold on manifesting your reality, your personal right. reality and collective reality. Well, that's the most awesome segue. I mean, many of the things that you said take me exactly where I was trying to go. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, bootstrap off of that because I, I don't remember exactly. It was a few months ago. I want to say it was on Greg Carlwood's show. Uh, he had somebody talking about um, manifestation and where you manifest from. Because um, if you try to manifest from the mind, well, the mind, the mind projects duality. The mind constructs this entire world of duality and that is its very nature. So if you project your intent from the mind, you not only manifest, you not only conjure what you're trying to conjure, but also it's negation, it's opposite. And you get some really screwy results that way. And so what I've been doing more recently in my spell casting is I don't even care whether my mind knows what's being projected, I just allow my heart to project what I need. Because it already knows. My mind doesn't even need to be involved. Um, you know, sometimes I know what I'm trying to manifest and sometimes I don't. But uh, if it doesn't come from the heart, it's not going to have a good outcome. It's not in a good way. Even if, you know, there's nothing negative about your intentions, just the fact that you're uh, projecting from your mind, which is the source of duality, you will get dualistic results. And um, so the heart being connected to spirit, spirit already knows what your path is. It can help you just ease you down that path uh, rather than having to struggle and butt up against a bunch of walls until you find your way through the maze, which is kind of what the mind does. And I'm not putting down the mind. Obviously, I'm a very, you know, I'm an air type. I'm a very mind-oriented person, uh, which is why I was, you know, in a PhD program in the first place. But when it comes to spirituality, it's really more about the heart. And stepping into the heart, I mean, I mean, I, I proposed that, you know, with Valentine's Day coming up, I really thought stepping into the heart, heart-shaped box kind of thing is, uh, was a good topic to, to go into. But um, it's also relevant to everything that's been going on with me. So when I was, faced with this situation. And by the way, at the time that this whole thing started, I've had a, you know, a thousand different things coming at me lately um, because I, I took on this project. I was uh, remodeling my, my little dorm room here at the dojo um, in part just to make it nice enough to be able to shoot video here so that I could actually make my shows from within my living space uh, because I had this, I had already had this vision of going forward with, um, with this, you know, internet show, podcast, blog type uh, thing. And um, the, the university stuff started happening, you know, 
right after I made this decision. And, you know, sometimes when I get, uh, when I get a lot of resistance from the system, I sort of take it as a sign that I'm actually doing the right thing. (laughs) Ironically, you know, you don't think that resistance means you're going the right way, but, uh, when you're dealing with something as satanic as, as the, you know, social order we live under, it pretty much counts backward in every sense. Um, So I didn't deliberately manifest this situation, but um, I projected from my heart what needed to be, um, you know, deliberately trying to bring success to this endeavor that I was starting out on, right? Uh, Creating a website, starting a show, the whole big thing. Plus, you know, just to expedite all of that, expedite, all of that, um, I was doing all of this remodeling of my room uh, to make it nicer to look at in the background. But um, so in the middle of that project, uh, the whole uh, university debacle comes about. And and um, so I have other fires to go put out and I have uh, these other situations. And now and then I'm on the out I'm, you know, looking for a job and having to do other things. I'm, I'm constantly getting pulled away from the, the thing that I'm trying to do uh, because the system, the system, the tyrant at the top of the system really doesn't want me doing what I'm doing. And that, that's what I feel. That's what I feel at a heart level, and that's why I feel that I'm doing the right thing. That's what my integrity tells me. And um, when I project from the heart i mean i wouldn't have projected from the mind losing losing my university gig i certainly wouldn't have projected you know failing to be able to finish the degree i've been working on for a year and a half but i don't look at it as a negative thing either it's uh leading me on to what my actual life's work is supposed to be at this time not uh, getting bogged down in, you know, trying to trying to teach in a system that is contrived to make people just resign, to make people give up and just go through the motions and not even bother. Um, and I guess we, we probably won't touch on some of those aspects of, of what's wrong with the education system just because of time at this point, but, um, but I do see this whole situation as kind of arising from the need for me to transition onto a more conscious, uh, path, a more conscious means of supporting myself. I mean, even if this doesn't support me, uh, entirely ever, or, uh, you know, I don't expect it to support me in the short term at all. But um, but it's a motion toward the the direction that I'm trying to go, and um, and all. So I had talked to you in some of some of the more preliminary stages of uh, of this idea. We had discussed the option of of me maybe even being featured on revolution radio you know as as my own host as a as a as an independent show yeah and i'd um, have to yeah i'd have to go through the channels but if we had openings you know i could definitely see you know i could help you with that and see if it you but, know could make it happen for sure and my 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 caveat at the time was well i'm a grad student i'm super busy i don't know if i can do an every week show that's kind of a lot and um well that (laughs) that situation has been taken away and i'm still looking at i mean i've already i've already started the website and i'm i'm still looking at making it uh more of a video show and and maybe more of a loose time frame in between productions than just every week at the same time however um the fact that I had this vision 
and I knew what I had to do. And then suddenly I'm, you know, my time is freed up to pursue the things that I need to do, despite the fact that there are many distractions that are pulling my energy away. Um, I can see what I have to do at this juncture in my life. And uh, that's, that's what the website is all about. And it's really just a placeholder at this point, but I should, I should mention it. Um, you can go on to rallymore.com, R-A-L-L-Y-M-O-O-R-E, more as in like a bogland or, or like a mooring where you would tie a boat, not more as in, you know, excess. But um, rallymore.com, and right now all you'll see is a giant version of my logo, but, um, but for your listeners, and if you want to go there, go ahead and check out that logo. I spent, I took me a lot of work to make that thing, but, um, and, and you can bookmark it if you want, because there will be, you know, artwork, videos, uh, different things, uh, that will start appearing on there as I get time to, um, to upload them and create them. Um, but I'm rolling forward with this, with this show idea. Um, of course, topics, I guess my, my generic, uh, theme for the show, I, I've been conceptualizing as Taoism, consciousness and freedom It's very much, you know, in the realm of spirituality and esoterica, uh, like a lot of our conversations, but um, this is going to start happening, and um, that's the website that you can go. I will also, you know, release the shows on YouTube, and this first one is going to be a little bit weird because it's, you know, involving this education system and this, you know, specific situation that arose in my life, um, but we'll get on to... Um, some really deep, some really deep subjects. And I really, I want to start building a vocabulary. I want to start building a vocabulary with whatever my audience is. If it's five people, fine. But um, so that we have the terms to even access some of these higher thoughts, because really what our society has done is it's deprived us of the concepts that will elevate us above the level of the insanity that we see in the world. Well, you just think they about just, like, they, yeah, you think about like the higher step once you get from the heart is divine will, which is deals with your voice. So that's got to be, a, you know, a way to for them to repress language, you know, repress vocabulary, you know, um, repress, um, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff so that we don't, we don't get to the point of divine will because we don't free ourselves from the third chakra, you know, when we step into the heart. I mean, so right, it's, it's like, just like with the yeah. media, they, they control people's minds through controlling the dialogue, through controlling, you know, the representation of what the issues of the day even are. And um, even more than that, the language has been controlled. Uh, like, I mean, the easiest and, and I don't know, I just, the best example of that is, again, going back to Max Egan and his word cacistocracy, which got removed from the dictionary because it was too relevant, I guess. <laughs> right? Okay, cacistocracy, cacistocracy, uh, rule by the shit people, rule by the worst <laughs> elements of society. Um, just so that, you know, we're clear on the, the meaning of that term, but it was literally removed from the dictionary. And um, he talks about it all the time uh, because it's kind of funny, but it's telling, it's telling in terms of how our, our symbols have been manipulated and the fact that we are so stuck on this symbolic representation of reality rather than engaging with actual reality because we're stuck in the mind duality and we don't understand the difference between symbols and what they represent. We are eating the menu and 
then we get stuck in this ridiculous, ridiculous world system that makes absolutely no sense for the species that it's imposed upon. And the only way they keep us in this slavery system is by controlling our minds through controlling the concepts that we can even express or, uh, you know, controlling the concepts that we're inculcated with so that some of the, the more esoteric ideas that you may get exposed to just sound ludicrous. It's, um, it's kind of like that John Lennon quote where he says, uh, you know, I think we're living in a mad world. I think we're living in a crazy society. And the odd thing about that is that just by saying that, people will call me crazy. And that's yeah. really how it works. Yeah. So the, um, yeah. Anyway, so we have like around nine minutes left. Um, I was thinking about um, when I was working with my teacher, Bobado. Um, he, um, you know, I would get maybe riled up about something or like my energy would get excessive. I'd leak energy or, you know, um, waste energy. Um, and he would say things to me like, you know, um, and I'm saying this because it helped me to even move further, deeper, kind of into my heart, into balance. Um, but he would say to me, you know, it, it is what it is and it will be what it will be. And um, which basically, you know, over time has come to mean that um, I can't change any of that, right? I can't change my reality. I can't change my world. I can't, I can't control it. But what I can control is where I'm at in that moment in the now, um, in the current space and how I choose to react or not react um, to it as it's, as it's playing out in front of me. Um, because I think we somehow get into a state where we want to try to control and manipulate all the things around us. And even Lujan Matus, when I interviewed him like years ago, that's the one thing he said. I said, so how do you think we should go about doing things like this or that? And finally he would say, basically, you know, um, you're just not in control <laughs> <laughs> of any of it. <laughs> so, um, you know, and um, he what? is big about integrity and stepping into the heart. Exactly the things that, that we are talking about right yeah. now. I yeah, really I love Luhan. I, I, yeah, I recommend all of his books. Yeah, Luhan has lots of books that you can buy even on Amazon and um, that will just, you know, change your life and blow your lid off. <laughs> and he's an unbelievable, powerful Pete person. And that's the other thing, too, is one thing I've learned about powerful beings on this planet is they love, they love a lot deeper because they're in a place of integrity. You know, nothing really rocks them. And they're the first ones to be able to have a moment, take time out of their busy schedules to just participate in that now, in that moment, and just see as long as it will go. Um, I just really feel blessed that Bobado and some of my other teachers were, you know, really living in the now and really living in you know, the current reality in, in this space. And because they were integrity, they could, um, you know, um, respect and honor and, and be in genuinely 100% in each moment, which made the relating and the relationship, um, you know, powerful and healing. So I want to just throw a couple things. Um, we'll just, um, I'll finish up in a few minutes, but is there anything else that you want to talk about here in our, our last, uh, you know, four or five minutes before we end to, to next week? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I just, I'll, I'll wrap up this way, I guess. Um, stepping into the heart is important. Your heart has to be open in order for you to even find what's in there. And um, 
the way we live in this society causes us to acquire a lot of scarring on our hearts. And it can be, you know, painful to open that up. That's why we're so shut down is because we've been so heartbroken in the past. And, um, you know, I've lived with that too. And uh, it's gotten a little better, but it's taken years. Um, It's been uh, probably about six years since I started opening my heart up for real, Um, you know, in my adult life. And, um, you know, there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of pain and it's, I've healed some of it and I've healed more and I've, I've managed to uh, make this a uh, uh, a livable thing. Uh, uh, it's okay for me to just hold my heart open all the time now. Uh, not that I don't still get some pain there, but um, you you have to get through that. You have to work through those things that have happened to you in the past so that you can access what's really in your heart and it's worth it that's it that's a good well that's good so i'm just going to kind of give some show stuff here so this is carrie in case you're wondering what you're listening to you're listening carrying stones and digging holes radio show on revolution radio freedomslips.com and my guest today is ryan hunter his uh soon to be website is uh rallymore.com uh, and he's got at least it up and going with his logo. More to come, more to be produced. Um, and um, let's see. And, you know, we are listener supported. So you can go to uh, Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, and you can um, look at the funding and all kinds of amazing ways to help us and all of us that do all this work for free um, for you, for the public, um, in the best way that we all know how to do. Um, so please support our network. Also, um, you can find me at the 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturday placement on Studio A. And uh, if you click the B, you will come to a bio and um, some contact information. And um, yeah, and so um, I was looking at, I just wanted to say, you know, I was looking at the um, logo this morning I really loved it, by the way. And it was interesting to me because I had a thing happen, like, you know, we'll put it in the multidimensional experience range, and it's a whole other story. But um, from that experience, um, in the middle of the night, this shield, this circle shield showed up, and it had, you know, around all the whole thing, around the edges, this wheel or shield or whatever you want to call it. Um, had all these different kinds of symbols and colors and all these different things on it and there was this hole in the center and there was this being like a really like you know like really like um, King Kongy looking but really sharp teeth you know like this crazy like really horrifying being and the being was trying to get at me through the shield but the shield was just showing me kind of like what was on the outskirts of, you know, what was going on in my energy field and in this being, you know, that kind of had, was watching me and kind of trying to try to take me down a little bit. And so, but there was the shield and the circle that was around that being that was used to protect me, right? And so when I was looking at your logo, I thought, oh, look at that, it's a shield. <laughs> And I'm like in the hole in the middle of it. I was like, what is it shielding him from? And I was like, oh, I know that. (laughs) So I was like checking it out. And uh, so I was like, huh, that's pretty interesting. I thought, wow, that's pretty good. I said, he sure really is coming along really well. (laughs) He's already like, you know, putting into a a visual, um, you know, some of these kinds of ideas right it's awesome all right ryan thank you thank you everybody all right we'll see you thanks bridget thanks for having me bye
Welcome to Revolution Radio, where you, the listeners, are in charge. Here at Revolution Radio, we present 48 broadcast hours of news and information each and every day. Revolution Radio never sleeps. Revolution Radio is worldwide and borderless information. Revolution Radio is also commercial free. Revolution Radio is supported 100% by you, the listeners. And that's why we appeal to you to donate and support this station and its expenses. You can support us in many available options like archive subscriptions, our seed pack selections, or even my woodworking store. And we also even have Revolution Radio's swag at the Revolution Radio Zazzle store, which you can get t-shirts, coffee cups, even a baby onesie. Or you can just plain donate to the cause. We cannot continue without your support, and your support is what helps pay the bills. So please, if you wish us to continue, please stop by our station support page and drop a dime on us. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival and gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or a computer failure took out your bank or all the banks. 